Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Metagenomics of Dozens of Earth Cities and One Space Station. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth and brought to you by Zymo Research. Zymo Research is a privately owned company that has been proudly serving the scientific community with state-of-the-art molecular biology tools since 1994. The beauty of science is to make things simple is a mantra that is reflected in every Zymo Research product, from epigenetics to DNA RNA purification solutions. Historically recognized as the leader in epigenetics, Today, Zymo Research is breaking boundaries with innovative solutions for microbiome measurements. Zymo Research is the first company to develop microbiome solutions from collection to conclusion based on new rigorous standards for microbiome measurements. Zymo Research has been leading the innovative to improve reproducibility and accuracy in the field by developing the first commercially available microbiome standards. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.zymoresearch.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into, a, into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Christopher E. Mason, the Associate Professor at Weill Cornell Medicine. For the complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Mason, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, uh, well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining for this uh, webinar on metagenomics and uh, best practices that we've been tinkering with and testing for teasing out as much as we can for a uh, look at large scale metagenomic studies, uh, everything from conferences to cities to space stations or one space station. Um, I'm uh, calling in here from Weill Cornell Medicine where I'm an associate professor and also a director of the Initiative for Quantitative Prediction from WorldQuant. And I'll start with a bit of background. So in particular, I think most of you who have seen the literature and are familiar with what's been published in the past few years are you know, deeply familiar with the fact that microbes are in us, on us, and all around us, and probably several kilograms uh, of your weight is likely made of microbes, including fungi and bacteria, if you include phages, which are smaller, but still all add to this weight. A really an extra organ in your body that really is a key mediator of both health and potentially disease. And these microbes change over time. So if you look at what are the proportions of different organisms that occur in, on, and around us, uh, you can even, to some degree, gauge uh, what, how old you are based on your microbial signature. Um, this is uh, from some data just on 16S, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And some of the exciting thing about microbes is not only that they're an entire extra organ and that they're dynamic and seem to be uh, a function of time and health and disease, uh, but they also do a lot of things for you. So in particular, uh, one of my favorite, you know, sort of summaries of this work has been through the Human Microbiome Project. I uh, also work from Mohamed Dania and Michael Fishback that shows that basically even antibiotics can be discovered from normal flora that are on our body. So studying the microbiome is not just an exercise, you know, really in fundamental human and microbial health, but also it can serve as a means to find, you know, new biosynthetic pathways, new drugs, even new antibiotics, uh, which is really, you know, kind of extraordinary. So and I'll come back to this later today of some of the actually billions of potential peptides we pulled out from um, assembled metagenomes from around the world. And so what's exciting is there's this really ongoing chemistry between you know, human cells, we like to call host cells in many cases, and the microbial cells, although the jury is out on who's really hosting who. But clearly, you know, they can and do you know, interact. You can see uh, this is how children interact with the world in some cases. Uh, and you know, what about in more modern environments? So for example, 
If you think about how on every given day, at least in New York City, 5.5 million people go in and out of the subway systems and transit systems, uh, and you can see here this itself is also an ongoing exchange and sort of interaction environment. And I got curious about this uh, because, you know, so many millions of people ride the subway is, you know, what, what happens there and how do we understand the dynamics in really dense urban environments as well as real large in, in clinical environments and even uh, farther places, for example, like I said, in space stations. So before I jump into all that, though, I want to talk about what we've learned, uh, a lot of this in, in partnership with Zymo, also on the sequencing side with a variety of different sequencing providers, including Illumina Pack, Bio, Oxford Nanopore, Thermo Fisher, you know, trying different uh, ways to figure out what we're measuring when we sequence something, because in particular, measurements themselves are really lenses into how you can see the world. So we, we've published this and others have looked at what are the differences between you know, 16S versus uh, shotgun sequencing. And there are, uh, especially for novel environments, really stark differences. Now for well-known samples, for example, like gut flora, uh, 16S will vastly oversimplify things. And this is because of, of how well it does in discriminating similar or distantly related species. So, you know, this paper here from Scientific Reports is one of our works on this, but uh, Gail Rosen and others uh, and Hershberg had a great paper on this a couple of years, a few years ago, looking at, like, let's pretend today we were to pick a new marker uh, that would be essentially a gene that you could use to amplify to characterize a complex microbial sample. And if you were to look at the distance between a closely and distantly related prokaryotes in green and blue, uh, respectively, your ability, is basically, if you look at amino acid identity, to, to characterize closely related prokaryotes is actually not that good for 16S ribosomal RNA sequence. It's, it's okay for distantly related prokaryotes, but it's still not even the best. And so one interesting sort of conclusion from this paper was that if we were to pick a different marker gene that's present in most uh, bacteria today, we probably wouldn't even pick 16S uh, as, a, as a marker because there's other ones that are, do a far better discriminatory job for both distantly and closely rooted prokaryotes. And so, you know, this has led us and others to really focus not so much on marker genes, but to really look more at metagenomics as a way to sort of shotgun sequence and break apart the DNA and query across the kingdoms. We uh, published a review article about this, kind of delineating why we have so much excitement about metagenomics. And it's mostly because of this slide, is that the, it gives you the capacity to find not only what is the taxonomic classifications across all domains and kingdoms of life, but also the more functional and mobile elements that are within uh, organisms like pl plasmids, phages, um, some of the BGCs that you can detect. You can't get any of these with a marker gene. And also AMR markers for antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial resistance you can pick up. Now clearly it is a little bit more expensive and you lose the ability to say, uh, you know, not have to worry about say human reads if you're taking a clinical sample. But overall we really are big fans of metagenomic sequencing uh, whenever and wherever uh, possible, very much so. so I think, um, and you know, these are the reasons why. So this is uh, some of our background there. And, and, you know, these questions of how do we sequence something and what are the pros and cons of sequencing things has come up before, too. So, for example, we've worked with the FDA in the Sequencing Quality Control Project to do these kinds of questions of, of benchmarking different sequencers on standardized samples. In this case, these are the MAQC samples, which were developed uh, by the FDA and with NIST, partnership with NIST which is really an old question. Like if I take the exact same two samples and send them to different labs, can I get the same answer? And we've now expanded this to the phase two study to look at metagenomics and epigenetics as well. I'll talk a little bit about the former today. So this, you know, again, it's in partnership, not just with the FDA, but also NIST and the Genome and Bottle Consortium to build out these standards to really rigorously test them. And as a quick plug for that, all of the data uh, that's made is publicly available and freely available. It's unembargoed for people to use for these very questions of how well am I doing when I'm sequencing something, uh, that's on the human side. And so it's one of the things I'm, uh, our, our lab is very proud to contribute to and help out with. But this is, you know, it's, it's in some cases the human genome is a little bit easier, right? The GC content is pretty well defined. There's some hard areas we're still teasing out. Uh, but, you know, really bacterial genomes can get much more complicated and even be much more, uh, you know, rough in terms of the repetitive structures. So over the past three, four years, ATCC has put out some controls you can see here. And data from their group has further highlighted the inability of 16S sequencing, even in different variable regions of the 16S gene, uh, to actually co correctly recapitulate the expected ratio of a titrated standard. So uh, th these and other data have continued to po point to the fact that you know we need better me methods of measuring the standards as well as better standards. And Zymo was one of the well, actually maybe the first, if not if not one of the first, it was the first I think group to come out with a mixed group standard. It is also the first and still I think the only standard that has both bacteria and yeast present. In this case, it's got Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Cryptococcus neoformans 
as well as gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, which you can see here. And, and Zymo's done some of their own testing to show, you know, what if you look at, you know, different methods of extraction, how does it change the proportions of organisms that you will see in gram-positive and gram-negative, and we know that this is an ongoing challenge in the field and a problem, and so these, these kinds of standards are really instrumental to being able to tease out what are, you know, really uh, uh, rigorous and accurate extraction of the nucleic acids in a sample. Uh, and that's just at the DNA level. If you look at the computational methods to analyze the data once you sequence it, there are many tools, dozens and dozens of tools, uh, many of which we keep on our IMSA website, uh, the International Metagenomics and Microbiome Standards Alliance, to tease this out. And we've also published some work on this work led by Alexa in our lab uh, to really characterize what are the, the, you know, how well do the different tools do, which ones do better in different contexts, and what are the parameters uh, for trying to pick which tools you should use. So, uh, as you can actually see here, you know, one of the things that we noticed is that at the genus level, for the precision and recall statistics, as well as the F1 and area under precision recall curve, most tools do not too bad, you know, in that context, you know, again, at the genus level. But if you look at essentially the species level, or if you go down to strain level analysis or subspecies, many tools really fall down in terms of their ability to pick up the strain or the subspecies. So this has been, you know, really an ongoing challenge in the field. And we were able to do a lot of these metrics because we had well-characterized samples, including controls uh, like from Zymo and others, to, to tease this out. But to highlight some of the ongoing challenge in this regard is that we took one of the samples we sequenced out to about 100 million reads and said, let's just run a variety of different tools to see how many species do we have in one sample, which is arguably one of the simplest questions you could ask about a microbiome sample is who's there. And even in this regard, it's really an extraordinary difference uh, of what's present depending on the tool that you use. So really, again, highlighting uh, some work to be done in the field and the need for standards. And so, you know, we, we've published sort of a mission statement about this to, to focus on this. And there's ongoing uh, monthly and quarterly calls, depending on the time of year, to go over updates on this. And it's important not just for work in the lab, but there's other strange places where you need standards. All right? so for example, uh, in halophilic uh, organisms that live in salty lakes, uh, there's no you know, current standard normally done for this. Or if you think, for example, uh, this is Scott Tai, when he went to Antarctica to do some nanopore sequencing, you can see here, you know, he had to get out there and, uh, and run some standards. And you know, this is actually what he started doing, is running standards out in the dry valley of Antarctica. And if you consider other weird places, like in New York City, this is the Gowanus Canal, which is a super fun site that's heavily polluted. You know, this is kind of a peculiar environment as well. Uh, and I'll close with, you know, the subways is another sort of interesting and unique environment. So a lot of our work in metagenomics uh, was was spurned, uh, or was really spawned, I should say, by this study we did uh, four years ago looking at what's present across the New York City metro, really out of curiosity to see what's there, because people generally, when they ride the subway, you can see here I found one woman who was ter terrified to touch the railing, even though the aperture of holes on that piece of paper towel is actually larger than most bacteria. So it's not even really helping her to do what she's hoping it's to do in this context. Plus, I'm a little bit terrified of what looks like has happened to that paper towel. It's definitely been used in a way that I don't have a lot of information about. But I did see one woman on the subway once with a sort of latex glove. It really did a one-up here. And so there's people who are generally just terrified to touch what's on these steel railings. And I became intri intrigued by that as, a, as I'm a New Yorker and riding the subways, but also became intrigued about this question when my daughter became old enough to ride the subways and was grabbing poles and riding one day and had accidentally grabbed and then decided to lick the subway pole one day. And this really led me to be curious, to think, well, there's you know, so many people riding the subway, my daughter's riding the subway. What is the exchange that's occurring when she grabs it with her hands or licks it with her mouth? Clearly, something's exchanging, but there was no data at all about what that was. There was no sort of metagenomic map of the metropolis that we live in uh, and in which we work. And so, the, you know, we said we need a map of the metropolis' microbiome, or the New Yorker called uh, the metropolome is sort of this idea of, of what we're trying to build out. And so we set out to do this uh, originally back in 2012 and 13, uh, and then basically wanted to build out this entire map. So we uh, created an app as well as a swabbing protocol and, and did uh, basically so you could put a timestamp and geotag on every sample that you looked at. Uh, brought these back to the lab, uh, extracted DNA for about 1,500 samples, uh, and then got about 10 billion sequence reads across them, and then basically used Metaflan as well as uh, Blast to, to see what was present, uh, as well as Serpy. And in all those samples, uh, I wanted to see, well, what, what are they mapping and what can we see? And still, one of my favorite components of the study is actually that the amount of DNA that didn't match any known organism uh, with even at least 80% identity was about half the DNA. It's something that's never been seen before. The, the majority of the rest was bacteria and other microbes. 
but really half the world under our fingertips is, is unknown. It represents this novel capacity for discovery of things that are all around us. And so I was really excited by this because if, if you think of like a rainforest and you look at the richness and the diversity of the animals and the plants and all these new organisms that could be there, most people get excited. They think about how, what can I discover in there? That's really an extraordinary place. What, what could we learn from such a uh, diverse ecosystem? And I actually would argue empirically that uh, subway poles and railings are pretty much uh, of the same ilk, is that they have this extraordinary breadth of discovery and, and you know, new species that we can discover uh, that we've just begun to tap into. And perhaps more, most interestingly is that we can map the density of different species around the city so we can see you know, where are you in the city based on your microbiome profile. Uh, in particular, uh, is you can see some areas uh, were very unique, right? We saw that we saw Staph aureus in different places, some Enterococci, but also some areas like Pseudorothomonas would pop up in only one area. It turns out this was the area of the, of the subway that was flooded by Hurricane Sandy. And so we worked with members of the transit system to get early access to the station before it was opened back up to the public because we got in there and sampled uh, different samples. And there are 10 different species that only showed up in this station, but that we didn't see anywhere else. And so initially, if you remember Hurricane Sandy, this was back in 2012, it knocked out NIH websites. It really brought a lot of sort of water into the city, created some of these, you know, kind of huge waves as they were coming through on with the big storm. It did also create really, you know, giant surges in the city. And you can see it, it, it looked kind of, well, it felt like this bad. It didn't actually look this bad. This was from the day after tomorrow, the movie. But that's how it felt for a little while, because in particular, uh, these parts of the subway system were uh, legitimately knocked down. This is the actual map from the transit system the day after the hurricane hit. And you can see here in parts in light gray have been you know, inactivated subway lines. And this is because some stations were completely submerged underwater. And we wanted to uh, really ask the question is, is there sort of a molecular echo of this cold ocean water you know, on the walls of the subway station? So we went in and swabbed them and characterized them and brought them back. And we could actually see there were different kinds of species like Shoanella frigida marina which is previously thought to be an Antarctic species uh, that actually makes something called the cosapentaenoic acid, uh, which actually is normally found, uh, this acid is normally found in fish and something that the fish eat as well. And if you have low levels of this in your diet, you actually have a higher risk for suicide. So you could argue this would be a good uh, organism that if you happen to come across that you might want to have uh, as part of your sort of subway pool uh, diet. And, um, you know, with this, you know, really some surprising features that came out of the data on the microbial scale. We also saw at the human scale, we could reconstruct the neighborhood in which people live based on the human alleles also present on the city services. So it was really both a human as well as a microbial genetic map uh, across the city. So this led us to do some continued work, which I'll talk a bit about today, is to think about, well, you know, that's interesting and a you know, peculiar study, but I, I've become really obsessed with this part of the graph, this sort of blue component, which is you know, all these unknown organisms and really want to know well, who's there you know, and what are they making? Like, what are these organisms doing there? Are they making new biosynthetic gene cluster molecules? Are they, you know, doing something unique in terms of their biology? And so it's really leads to the question of, you know, you know, what have we been missing that might have been there under our fingertips all this time? So uh, we um, launched a partnership. I also got a grant uh, with WorldQuant and with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to map essentially the global distribution of the species as well as their antimicrobial resistance with a project uh, called Metasub, or the Metagenomics and Design of Subways and Urban Biomes. And our goals here are really you know, threefold, is to map these sort of metagenomic profiles across uh, cities around the world. And this gives us also a forensic map to potentially. Then also to track uh, the antimicrobial resistance markers and also then the new biosynthetic gene clusters as a way to predict new drugs. And so in particular, you know, this, you know, we, we do this as a consortium across dozens of cities. And once a year, we have something uh, called a Global City Sampling Day, where we go across the world in a coordinated fashion with a uniform protocol, basically swab the whole planet. So in particular, uh, we have, uh, let me go back here. So in particular, we set up, uh, we do training rituals. We set up uh, sort of programs to get people ready to do the swabbing. We work with city officials to go out and do swabbing. We also, in some cases, uh, swab the uh, badge for, uh, for the policemen and women who help out. We have uh, partners and collaborators all over the world who help. We also partner with the Clinical Translational Science Center. So we have, again, project coordinators, training videos. Uh, people, you know, get uh, swabs and get food when they're out there swabbing all day. Uh, so we have this large-scale collaborative project. And we also, as we're collecting samples, we collect a lot of metadata. So, for, for example, where are you in the station? What is the material composed of? 
uh, what's the temperature that day, where, what's the humidity, some other sort of information about the samples. And generally you get about 4 to 12 million reads per sample, uh, paired in 150 reads, as a way to characterize what's present. And so in the past uh, few years, we've actually gotten usually at least 6,000 samples per year. Uh, we're actually doing June 21st again this year, the sampling, and we should be on track to get about 10,000 samples this year from about 100 cities. So it's an uh, ongoing expanded project that we'll uh, be planning to wrap up at the end of next year. And what's extraordinary about this is, you know, not just the data, but also the metadata. So we can start to tease out other patterns of what's present and what might be driving some of these new biological features. So this includes interesting things like these data have been used to basically generate 17 new bacterial and three arterial phyla, entirely new phyla that have been derived from the shotgun sequence data. And I'll present to you today a little bit of the preliminary results of the, the global study that we're submitting shortly of what we can see so far in the first two years of data. So in particular, if you look across about the 3,000 samples we finished sequencing on, uh, we you know, have done QC and trimming and adapter uh, cleanup. We, uh, we can see that the, the rarefaction plot, or how many species are we discovering as a function of how many samples we've sequenced, you can see is not plateauing. So we still think there's a, a large number of samples for us to, uh, to keep, um, you know, a large number of species for us to keep finding based on these data. We can see that the species richness and Shannon entropy across the whole data set is, is widely variable. In particular, if you look on the right, the different cities, the amount of Shannon entropy that's present really varies between Barcelona, which is you know, more of a, a lower entropy, whereas Sacramento has the greatest diversity of what we can see in the microbiome, uh, you know, for reasons that are not yet clear, but I'll get into some of the ideas we have on this. But really there are, you know, each, each city has its own sort of unique microbial profile, as you can see here. We also see that the abundance of different species uh, in different cities is also distinct. So we see some known human commensals that are present, but we also see, you know, a wide range uh, of other species you know, that seem to be, in some cases, very specific to a city, in other cases are more sort of these consistent taxa uh, that we, that we you know, keep finding again and again. Uh, mostly the, like, cunobacter acne is really a common skin commensal, so that's not at all surprising. But we've begun to look at some of the other questions in this. So, for example, you know, do we see uh, richness as a function of the population density or the elevation of the city or the temperature uh, or the surface material? And, you know, so far we see some positive trends uh, in, in general, for example, the species prevalence and richness, uh, you know, seems to be equally distributed across the different cities, but the temperature and latitude uh, do seem to have a bit of an effect. Uh, these are some very new analyses that we're still looking at for the metadata, but we do see some potential trends. The other thing we've been looking in the data, though, is, is not just that, you know, whether some associations, but what else are the new things we can learn from these data. So we've actually partnered uh, with ArcBio, uh, certain with Arbor Biotechnology. Uh, uh, we've also partnered a bit with ArcBio for other things. But we um, you know, wanted to see of these new contigs that we've done de novo assembly on, how many of them are potentially novel as a function of say, are they five or 20% divergent from their ratio if you look at the protein uh, sequence identity. In this case, we see, as you can see here, really you know, billions of novel peptides that are really under our fingertips uh, that, that we can have characterized. And, and interestingly, Tokyo has the most number of novel peptides, uh, perhaps representing uh, it's a general sort of microbial diversity that's present uh, in that country and also what you can see uh, far and above other cities. So it's very interesting in that regard. We've also worked with uh, John Brownstein and Health Map to actually make, you know, a new uh, map of AMRs in the different cities from the Metasub data. So this gives us a way to track, map, and then also predict the new directions of antimicrobial resistance as they're appearing uh, around the world. And so you can actually go to this website and play with the data a bit and see where are the different AMR markers appearing. And then eventually, you know, you can start to think about where they're going as a uh, building a model. So, so far, for example, we see the center of London has uh, the greatest amount and complexity of the AMRs that we've seen from different cities. So, this gives you interesting maps of, you know, where are they occurring. And this, you know, this led us to a number of questions. Like, okay, we can see these AMRs, but what, where is this coming from and why is this occurring at all? Uh, we, you know, we, again, looked at every city has its own AMR profile, just like its own microbial profile. But what's interesting is what we think is driving this, at least based on some of the data from we've compared in six different cities, what's the known WHO data on the over-the-counter antibiotic use? And then what's the sort of density and the number of reads we're seeing to different AMR markers? And we can see a positive and significant correlation uh, between both, you know, chromosome-embedded AMRs and, and well, those on plasmids that seem to be the amount of, you know, antibiotic use by the population is to some degree reflected 
by what's on the surfaces in the air of their subway systems. This is an interesting you know, independent metric of AMR uh, presence and, and uh, over the antibiotic usage effectively in the different cities, uh, which is what we think is probably driving some of this. So uh, we plan to continue, you know, this, like I said, at least out until 2020, and not just a question of what's happening, you know, really, you know, sort of you know, in general in a city, but what happens when a million people or two million people come into a city before, during, after large-scale mi migration events like the Olympics, so we did this in Rio, and we're completely we're doing the same thing in Tokyo next year. And so this will be an ongoing uh, sort of quest to see how not only where they are, but how are they moving and how fast they move. So that's uh, sort of a quick summary of the Medisa project, which we have partnered a lot with Zymo on this because we're using uh, their extraction kits and also yeah, using their positive and negative controls for all the sampling and all the different sites. So that that's at the uh, that's the, the second part of the talk. I want to get to a couple of the parts about sort of metagenomic forensics, and then also a little bit about space metagenomics uh, at the end. So one of the other things we want to look at with metagenomics is, you know, we can sequence things and map them to all known species, but what all can you learn about someone from a surface or their phone, for example? So we're we're not the first people to think about this, of course. There's, a, you know, some early work from Rob Knight and colleagues who start to think about, you know, what can you learn from, you know, skin bacteria communities? You know, could you actually have a microbiome aura that's as distinctive as your fingerprint? You know, and then uh, other work that's shown that the microbiome correct from Jack Gilbert could put you at the scene of a crime potentially. So it does have an interesting forensics application. And then uh, finally, there's also you know new lifestyle chemistries that you can infer just from people's phones, uh, from Peter Dorstein and also Rob Knight. And you know we think of lifestyle chemistries. A lot of people think of Breaking Bad or something like that. But it's more actually uh, like what's on your phone, the echoes of the drugs you're taking. Uh, and essentially, you know, what is in uh, what medications you're taking, what are the fatty acids you're in touch with. So it does give you an interesting uh, survey of the molecules that, that people have and what they're doing in their life. And it's also, you know, different from your shoes versus your phones. You know, there are differences between them. You know, so here too, there are you know distinctions to be made uh, based on where you get the sample. So, you know, the, a lot of these studies though, it took a matter of weeks or months to get out and get the data and get published. We wanted to see if we could start to do some of this uh, kind of work in more of a 24, 48-hour period. So the first time we did this was at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference last year, and we got everyone together and said, okay, we're going to collect uh, all your swabs at the beginning as you check in for the conference. Uh, go to, we partnered with Illumina to go prep libraries at their accelerator in San Francisco. Analyze the data with Metagen Scope, which is an uh, open access and freely available metagenomics pipeline from our group, which does basically a characterization across human DNA, other microbes gives you taxonomy and also functional profiles. After that, we also do annotation based on what strain looks to be present, what's the microbe census, uh, what are the classifications across different databases. And then finally, uh, we didn't do this for this session, but we normally do also annotations to get a sense of what's present for de novo assemblies. And after you know proving it there, we then also went to the ABRF uh, meeting and said, well, let's see if we can uh, predict what's on your phone at this meeting. So we did the same thing, collected samples, uh, worked, uh, again, partnered with Illumina to go, in this case, to San Diego, did library prep, uh, did the analysis, and then presented it on the last day of the meeting. And we wanted to know, you know, can your phone reveal what you've been eating or doing? And, you know, this has also been published by other groups. Like, for example, can you look at eukaryotes on uh, the ATMs? And in particular, we know that the ATM is covered in microbes, but also could be associated with, say, you know, different food as a function of different ancestry. So, like, you know, different demographics were here if you look at where fish was being eaten or chicken was being was showing up or different kinds of cheeses. So, you know, this this uh, inspired a bit by some of this work, we thought, well, what do we see at the conference? So we first looked at the first 96 samples and said, what do we see here? You can see human DNA in blue, unknown bacterial, viral, and archaeal DNA, mostly bacteria, mostly human, as expected. But we do see a lot of, you know, a few interesting trends. The first is two samples were our, bi our biomass controls, and these are bacteria that we expected. The rest of them are actually uh, the, the, the yeast uh, DNA that you can see there. And then we looked at the amount of unknown DNA here in black. You can see some people really stood out. In fact, one person looked almost like an alien creature. 94% of her DNA was unknown, which is interesting. Then we also looked at what's the mapping of reads to different uh, effectively eukaryotic uh, sort of genomes for things like, you know, meats, fruits, vegetables, and pets. And some people really stood out. So, for example, I, I rubbed an apple on my phone before I really sequenced it, and it worked, so I was a good positive control. One person had a huge amount of corn on his phone, and this turned out to be Scott Ty, who had confessed that he'd spilled a whole bag of corn tortilla chips on his phone on his way to the conference, which apparently was still present on the phone, which is interesting. This is a woman who had just eaten a salad uh, before giving us her phone, apparently quite messily. 
uh, and this is someone who looked like an orange, someone who, uh, this is a woman who thought she had a lot of uh, cow DNA on her phone, and she had just purchased a leather purse, uh, which is interesting because maybe there was still some DNA being deposited on her phone. But the person with the orange, we said, you know, hey, did you just uh, have an orange or orange juice? And he just peeled and eaten a navel orange, which was very fun and funny to see. And we also found someone who looked like that a pork, porcine DNA's phone. Uh, this turned out to be uh, Shridhar, who said, yes, he did have pulled pork and took a picture of it, of his uh, of his sandwich after the, he ate it, so, or as he was eating it. So this gave us a chance to see who's the guy who had pulled pork, and this sandwich was basically still on his phone. We also did some other predictions, like, so, you know, the differences in job categories, like, you know, uh, most people's phones look like skin or airway bacteria, but some people actually did look like uh, the urogenital tract. It turns out this was the people who were self-identified as engineers, uh, and this actually statistically is likely to have come from a man because most of the engineers are men, uh, likely. So uh, it's interesting that, that might be happening. There are some people not washing their hands, is what we think. We also did a prediction of who has cats or dogs, just a yes or no binary classifier, and we could see a little bit of signal for cats, uh, but dogs was much more of a, a clear signal that people's uh, dog DNA was showing up on their phone, which was interesting to see. And we also did some work with Cosmos ID to see can we predict antibiotic resistance, and indeed, not surprisingly, uh, most uh, phones did have some, but you know, this is not necessarily surprising because you know even bacteria that are from millions of years ago have AMR markers uh, that are present. So it really affirms that the conservation of resistance occurs over millions of years uh, and is something that's not surprising. It's surprising though when it moves quickly or changes its form or its mutation profile. Okay, so in the last few um, sections of the talk, I wanna go into other places we're applying, uh, you know, Zymo standards, Zymo methods, and general metagenomics profiles. Uh, since, uh, you know, we've been, uh, Zymo's partnering to sponsor this, wanna talk about how we're using you know, some of their control. So one of the places that we've just used it is that uh, we published work last month looking at the identical twins, Mark and Scott Kelly, and what happened to them uh, when they went up into space. So uh, NASA really likes lots of uh, acronyms in general. They're also a cool organization to work with because sometimes for certain missions you'll get a patch. And so in this case, we did get a patch and you can see in the middle of the DNA, we see these epigenetic marks. So you can see, at least as far as I know, it's the first patch uh, from NASA that has epigenetics and multi-omics uh, on it, and so you can see some of the profiles here. And thinking about the microbial profile, uh, from some work from uh, Stephen Green and Fred Turek and Martha Vitinera, you know, we can actually see as part of this study, the, you know, the, the, when you look for the strains, the diversity, you can see each one of these colors is a different strain, and this is what the sample's taken on in the space station. The diversity was mostly maintained, but the Fermi-Cutes to bacteria's ratio, you know, did shift, you can see in flight, but then came back to normal you know, at the end of the mission. So this seemed to be a plastic feature of human spaceflight is that your microbiome will shift but can't come back to normal once you come back to this terrestrial lifestyle. Uh, we also have done additional sequencing and are writing up more results on not just the fecal microbiome but also the buccal and saliva. And here we can see from a Disney plot, you know, the buccal and saliva samples do separate out into different groups, which is always a very good thing when you're looking at uh, saliva and fecal samples. You don't want them to cluster together, so that was good to see. The other interesting thing is, you know, if we look at what's in the data, we can see these are essentially the, the fecal samples and the saliva and buccal are here on the right. The mapping of reads to different sort of uh, kingdoms of life, we can see that, you know, you can actually tease out uh, other organisms that are present uh, in, these, uh, in these samples. We basically can see what they are eating, what the astronauts have been eating uh, while they're in space or whether they're here on Earth. And so this really gives you a unique profile of, you know, essentially, you know, metagenomics of the, of the mouth and the food that people are eating. Uh, which is an interesting sort of confirmation uh, for diet. And so a lot of these samples we had to bring back down to earth. It was, you know, laborious, it was complicated at the cost of $10,000 per kilogram. Uh, it's, that's not the easiest way uh, to get things up and down. So we started asking this question a few years ago, saying, well, could we just sequence in space? And so when I'd asked uh, originally Oxford Danafor, they said, well, have you talked to Aaron Burton yet or Sarah Castro Wallace? And I said, no, so we went and had some beers and said, well, I think the thing it should be possible because, you know, the sequence is small enough. We have a way to do it. Uh, we just need to actually uh, get it up into space and make sure we could uh, get the, the technology to work. So I said, all right, great. Well, let's let's get things started. And we should actually prepare to take something like, you know, something like a smidgen or an iPhone-powered sequencer. Should we do that? And uh, Or should we somehow connect it? So I said, well, I think we can figure out something. So uh, first thing we needed, though, of course, it's NASA. So we should probably have a patch and said, okay, great. We've got a patch set up. That was uh, that was all set up. It was superb. Uh, then we tested it in a zero gravity flight simulator. Uh, this is uh, it showed that it worked, so we knew it should work. 
uh, published this in uh, Nature Partner Journal Microgravity and showed that it was there ready. Uh, then uh, Kate Rubens was the next to go up into space, made her way up to the space station, uh, you know, got up there safely, did the first uh, sequencing in space. And so in the last two years, it's now become relatively standard to do uh, sequencing in space. And, you know, this is really, uh, some called it the dawn of genomics in space. Uh, which was a bit hyperbolic, but kind of true. You can see uh, here at the end, it was retweeted by four people, including myself. We didn't get a Donald Trump retweet, uh, you know, it was a bit early then for Trump to be retweeting, but, you know, maybe next time. Uh, but we've since published this also as the, um, uh, this is the first sort of genome uh, that was sequenced and assembled uh, off Earth. This was published a year and a half ago. But we've also been looking uh, subsequently at other aspects of these samples. So in particular, all nucleic acids really deserve some consideration. So in particular, Bacteria are splattered with these uh, 6-methyladenosine uh, DNA modification marks. You can see an example of it here uh, from Eric Schatt. And, you know, we've been testing uh, some of these data. This is from an algorithm called mCaller to see, you know, can we see these, these deviations in the current from uh, observed versus expected current. Uh, you can see here the M6A versus A. And you can see these, these deviations occur when you do have a modified base as the DNA transits through the pore. Uh, and indeed, if you get more coverage and you get, you know, essentially enough high-quality reads, you can discriminate between the modified base and the regular adenosine with pretty good accuracy. And so we've actually uh, just published this a couple months ago uh, as a new method uh, for characterizing the modified bases in these samples. Uh, and we did this actually very much uh, in close concert with Zymo because these are the probably some of the best characterized reference chains that exist. And so we've added an epigenetic characterization of them, and it's also worth noting uh, we've managed to get this to work uh, in, in flight as well. So for some of the data that's been generated on the space station, we can now reliably say you can detect modified bases um, using nanopore sequencing in space as well. And so uh, what's exciting about this is, you know, ongoing work from Sarah Castro-Wallace and some work from our group and others is to optimize the methods uh, to get this to work in space. And, as, you know, essentially it's been now demonstrated you can do library prep in space, you can do sequencing, uh, so, you know, for far, for longer missions, this will really, I think, be, uh, you know, what would be one of the key tools uh, for characterizing what's present in these environments. Uh, and this includes these ZIMO controls, which are, I think are the first uh, controls to have been used for space flight uh, validation. The other thing that's worth noting is uh, we're not the first people or the only people interested in these uh, data sets. So, now uh, you can see here some of the other work that was done was taking ultra long, uh, ultra deep and long read nanoport sequencing of these standards. So in particular, uh, uh, the work from Sam Nichols and Nick Lohman and others actually validated what we saw in our data and used, used our data to, to confirm some of their contigs and their assemblies for these IMO controls. So in particular, on the gridiron and the Promethean, they've confirmed the log uh, sort of con the log titrated controls to work very well on both platforms for each one of these different bacterial and fungal species. And also, if you look at their assemblies, you can see here uh, this basically is the number of 10 kb fragments along the assembly. And if you can see down here, the log titrated standards, of course, have some gaps because the species that are less abundant uh, don't show up as much. And you can see that down here at the bottom. But for sort of the equimolar titrated mixtures, you can see, you know, get really good assembly and good contiguity uh, for the assemblies. And so I think this creates, you know, you know, again, these standards really give us a benchmark going forward to make sure that when we when we look at something, whether it's from outer space or something in a clinical lab, that we know that what we're doing uh, is actually accurate and it's been well validated. And so we're really excited that a lot of these data have come out in the last few months to have really rigorous assessment of these standards. So in the last uh, closing segment, I want to think a bit more uh, on a bit of a philosophical note and not just think about, you know, measuring things, but also to, to think about building microbes and modifying even genomes. And so um, this depends on the totality of information that we have about right, all of genetics. So what, if you were to start to not just measure organisms, but actually build them and build microbes, for example, you know, what could that look like? Or if we found microbes, for example, when the Mars 2020 run, it goes to Mars in the next year, and eventually it's supposed to bring rocks back from Mars in a sample return mission, uh, how will we be able to tell that we didn't just bring something back that we contaminated the rover with when it was being built? Uh, so some of these questions involve um, in details of what's called planetary protection, which is to avoid contamination of other planets by our things and the, and the inverse as well. We don't want other planets to contaminate Earth with something that could be potentially harmful. 
Uh, so to do this, though, if you think about it, like if we, it's a simple question, but to do it, you would need to basically index all of the DNA that's ever been sequenced on Earth, and then care, and compare that to everything that's ever that you might pull back if something comes back from, say, the Mars, or the the Mars or the Moon. Um, and if you think about how much information that is, it's basically sort of Yoda knobs. You think of like nucleic acid uh, nucleotide operations per second instead of you know gigaflops or Yoda flops, is like Yoda knobs is the amount of total DNA. It's the equivalent of, uh, you know, 10 to the 21 supercomputers. So it's pretty, uh, it's a lot of data. If you were to actually index all the DNA on Earth that could be there, and if you were to use it as a, as a compute engine, it's pretty impressive. But, you know, we don't have to do just that. We were, we're working on methods to do this, and so are uh, many others, but we don't have to do that alone. We can also uh, sequence what's in the clean room as a good proxy for something that might be a false positive. So we've been working uh, with uh, Venkat from JPL, uh, and uh, basically, it's swabbing the clean rooms as they're as they're building robots, as they're building the spacecraft, and characterizing what's present on them, and then sequencing them. We've also been looking at what's growing on the walls of the space station and what's actually present uh, on the ISS. So there's another sort of uh, you know catalog of where DNA can and and will appear. And the other thing we've looked at is you know this this catalog we then compare to what's uh, on the astronauts before and after they go up. So from Mark and Scott Kelly, we've seen that. You know, this microbial tracking data, which is on the station, we compare that to the astronauts' data, and we can start to build these maps for the first time of what's being transferred from the astronauts to the space station and vice versa. And we're in the process of uh, uh, submitting these papers now. And so it's interesting we can see, you know, working with uh, Dr. Katsuri and Karatwaran, we can actually see some of these dynamics by comparing astronaut data to the microbial data on the ISS, and which gives us kind of this interesting, you know, closed environment and seeing how uh, microbial dynamics uh, you know, move around, especially on that environment. So uh, that's uh, some ongoing work there. And this uh, ends again with a bit more of a, uh, you know, almost philosophical note is that we, could, could you, for example, engineer the microbiome of astronauts to help them for long-term missions or, or engineer the genomes of astronauts potentially so they can make more of their essential amino acids? Uh, it, you know, it seems like there are some ways to do it potentially, but then it begs the question of, well, you know, should we do such a thing? Is that, is that a good idea at all to actually start to even plan for such a thing? Uh, but, you know, these discussions, of course, involve really big big questions of, of editing and the rights and responsibilities to do such a thing. I think it's it's far away now, at least in practice, because this is more of a philosophical discussion, but work from Jen Kui He has shown that even CRISPRing human embryos and having them be born has already happened. So this is no longer just philosophical debate. It's interesting to think about you know uh, how it, how it might be applied someday, uh, or should it be applied? And uh, this includes you know human DNA as well as microbial engineering for both the space station as well as the human microbiome that gets sent out to faraway places. So if you think about you know going to Mars for example and the time it'll take to get there, uh, and engineering astronauts and their microbiomes, uh, or even engineering the planet's microbiome so it could be sustainable for human life, it, it seems like a really audacious goal. But I would argue that you know we're already doing that on Earth having a planetary scale monitoring, measuring, and also manipulation, sometimes not that well. Uh, but you know, doing it on Mars will actually just be the second time that we've done this, not the first. Uh, and then to a large degree, I think we'll have to think about things from the totality of human uh, genetics, microbial genetics, the interaction, the environment, and think about ways that we measure that, model it, and even engineer it. And along the way, we'll need really good methods for all the extraction, all the sequencing, all the controls, and all the characterization uh, for, for both improved biomedical applications as well as for some of these engineering ideas. So in conclusion, uh, thank you for your time. And I'll say that you know what we've seen is that people's phones and high-touch services look generally like skin. They have a lot of unknown sequences and that we have so far millions of potential uh, biosynthetic gene clusters and billions of peptides across the whole data set. The, um, these IMO standards I mentioned are, are available for ordering and testing, and I highly recommend them for positive controls. On every 96-well plate we run in lab, we have a Zymo control just to make sure that we have uh, a little bit of a sanity check every time we do uh, multiplexing. And um, forensics apply to all kingdoms of life, uh, including on your phone. And we do see that the AMR markers, the data coming out of Metasub looks uh, like it's related and sort of really an echo of the over-the-counter antibiotic use uh, or access to it, so which is which is interesting to think about as a, as a metric for different cities and what we observe. And working with uh, Sarah Castro-Wallace and Aaron Burton uh, and also Kate Rubens, we do have a first demonstration of some ISS-based sequencing and AMR detection. Uh, this is now ISS-validated hardware that people can submit grants to NASA uh, or to CASIS for work to do uh, on the space station and do sequencing. 
So at the end, I can't I really have to thank everyone in the lab because none of this would be possible without them. They are superb. They're awesome uh, and inspiring. I want to thank also uh, the uh, JPL and NASA collaborators, uh, Stacey Horner, Venkat, and Charles Chu, helping with some of these uh, collaborations. Thanks also to collaborators who helped a lot with MetaSub all over New York City and around the world for collecting samples. Thanks very much to funding, of course, uh, from NASA, World Quant, Gates Foundation, the NIH, uh, and the Star Cancer Consortium. And finally, thanks to many collaborators, friends, colleagues, uh, and uh, many people who helped along the way. And I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mason, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, does any system provide a more accurate profile based on using mock microbial communities? Uh, good question. So the, the short answer is, is yes, and it depends on where you're looking at. So long read platforms give you better uh, ability to do contiguous assemblies to characterize you know, through repetitive regions. Illumina has the best you know, single nucleotide accuracy. So if you're looking for SNPs, uh, that still is, is the best in the short term. PacBio, if you do circular consensus sequence read, that actually can give even greater accuracy for SNPs, uh, assuming that you have enough coverage uh, to get CCS reads. But that that is, if, if you've got enough coverage uh, and DNA input, then that's a, arguably even the best way for SNPs. And then 10X Genomics, uh, is, there's a newer work in metagenomics happening there, but it is uh, also helping for assembly and for mapping. And so the, the, each are different, but um, it's also worth noting that PacBio and Oxford Nanopore are the only two that can give you the epigenetic uh, modifications, at least natively. You know, with Illumina, you could do bisulfite treatment and then infer it, but um, uh, the native single molecule methods give you uh, a capacity to look at all the base modifications as well. Thank you. While metagenomic approaches can track the presence of any one organism, will there ever be the ability to track whether the organism was in fact alive at the time of collection versus just a DNA RNA remnant using NGS? Uh, yes. Uh, so that is um, a great question. So there are, you know, this used to be about three or four years ago, it was not really, uh, not that possible, frankly, to do it. But there are now multiple ways uh, in which you can characterize this. So there's inferred replication rates, something called IREP is one of the tools. There's some other tools that have come out since then uh, that let you basically you know, uh, distinguish whether something was alive or dead based on the coverage statistics of what's present, um, you know, across the coverage of the genome. So if most genomes that are circular, you know, if you actually have even coverage across the genome, it indicates it's not uh, replicating that fast, whereas if you actually have you know, uh, a spike near the origin of replication that then does indicate that you actually have something uh, that's actually, you know, it's alive and, and replicating. So I think, um, you know, this is, a, you know, this is a, now ways just from DNA, you get a lot more information uh, about what's what's happening uh, in a sample. And so there, there was, as I mentioned, there's IREP as one way, but there's also another method um, that was called GRID for the gro growth rate index method that was published uh, just late last year. Great, thank you. All right, your next question is, are these large-scale studies discovering any novel antimicrobial resistance markers not predicted by smaller or directed studies, or alternatively, discovering unpredicted variations on existing markers? Good question. So, so far we focused on the known markers in the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database, or CARD, but we there are many fragments that look like they're distinct uh, new markers. We haven't focused too much on them yet, but mostly so far we're looking at variations of existing markers and seeing how and when they move and to what degree. Great, thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question. As people are constantly traveling and settling around the world, do you think that distinct regional microbial molecular signatures will stay possible in the future? And if so, what do you think is the primary driving force between the microbial profile of any one region? Yeah, I think this is a bit like human allele fractions, is that as people travel more, the, the uniqueness features will decrease over time. But the reservoirs for bacterial sequences and, and cells is so vast I do think that you'll see, you know, some signatures, especially in highly diverse areas, might be able to maintain, you know, in perpetuity. 
and a lot of this is based on uh, well things that we know from actually ecology like temperature and humidity uh, as well as elevation uh, do seem to, to you know drive these changes. But another one that's very novel is or you know a antibiotic usage, which also drives it. So there are new human derived uh, drivers as well as environmental uh, mediators of these uh, dynamics, and I think they're all in play. But I think um, you know I think I think they'll, you'll still have them in the future. Thank you again, Dr. Mason, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Zymo Research, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Labyrinth will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.